There's a lot of confusion on the Buddhist teachings about change. And the confusion tends to fall into two types. First is the idea that the Buddha said all change is bad. And the other is that he said change is basically good. He didn't teach either of those things. After all, not all change is bad in his eyes. He said that when pain changes, it's actually pleasant in the fact that it's changing from pain. And the fact that our minds can change and be trained is what makes his teaching possible. As he said, skillful qualities can be developed, unskillful ones can be abandoned. If the skillful qualities couldn't be developed, there'd be no point in his teaching. If they couldn't be abandoned, there would be no point in his teachings. So those kinds of change are actually good. But then again, he didn't say that all change was good. There's a belief that he said you have to accept the fact that everything is changing, and so you have to adjust your aims toward happiness to the fact that there will never be a permanent happiness and a lasting happiness. Just learn how to accept change, and then you won't suffer. Then again, that's another misunderstanding. He said there is a deathless happiness. People get the context here mixed up. They think that the Buddha starts with the idea that everything changes, and then you try to look for happiness in a world there's, where there's nothing but change. That's putting change before your desire for happiness. But actually, he puts your desire for true happiness first. It's probably the only teacher I know of who does. He says, you honor your desire for a true happiness. And then with that, then you look at the facts of change, which changes are good and which changes are bad, which changes will actually help in your de finding that desired happiness and which ones get in the way. Two kinds of change, he said, are particularly dangerous. The first has to do with looking for happiness. It's going to be lasting, but looking for it in things that are going to change and turn on you. This is an issue of wisdom. It's our lack of wisdom, our lack of discernment, that we're looking in the wrong places for happiness. The other change that's dangerous is the fact that the mind can change so quickly. As he once said, the mind is so quick to change that there is no adequate analogy for how fast it is. Even the twinkling of an eye is too slow. You can work for years and years on something, and suddenly your mind changes and reverses on itself, for no apparent reason at all. Or when conditions are good, you would behave in a good way, but then when conditions get difficult, you're another person. Those are the two kinds of changes that you have to watch out for. The first one, as I said, is an issue of discernment. The second one is an issue of mindfulness. This is why mindfulness and discernment are so basic to his teaching. In the beginning, you simply go on conviction that when the Buddha said there is a deathless happiness, it's there. And you take that possibility as your measurement for looking at the different kinds of happiness that you're settling for in your life. Are they really good? Are they really reliable? All too often we focus our sights on something, and then we turn our blinders to everything else. The fact that what we want is going to change, we just forget about it or say it doesn't matter, or say, I'll deal with that when it happens. But the dealing with it, especially if you've gotten really addicted to that particular kind of happiness, is going to be very difficult. So you want to bring wisdom to the fact that you want a happiness that's lasting. And you realize it has to come from your own actions. This is where all the other factors of the path come in. It requires not only discernment, but also virtue and concentration. Because any happiness that's not based on these qualities is sure to, sure to fall apart. And even some of the happiness that comes with the path is going to fall apart. If you let yourself just stop where you are and say, well, this is good enough for me. You've got a little bit of concentration, that's good enough for me. You've got a little bit of 
well-being. You say, it's good enough for me. As the Buddha said, the secret to his awakening was not to rest content with skillful qualities. So you work on what you've got, maintain what you've got, and then as it gets more and more solid, then you look for areas in which you can improve it. Now mindfulness comes in as, to, as your way of helping to protect the mind from its sudden changes. You learn how to stitch the moments of the mind together. So when you've learned a good lesson, okay, you, you can remember, you can keep it in mind. You bring it to bear on whatever comes up. You may know that something is unskillful, and then something inside you decides it doesn't matter. Well, that's a lack of shame, and it's a lack of compunction. They put blinders around you. They say, this doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, I'm going to go straight for what I want. Then they actually make the ability to remember something more and more difficult. They're the real enemies of mindfulness. So when that thought comes up, it doesn't matter. Ask yourself, well, it doesn't matter in what context. And the Buddha says it's good to keep in mind that there are, are beings who have found the way to true happiness, they've attained true happiness, and they look back on us and they have pity for us. But they've also learned to have a sense of real disgust toward the types of mental states that would lead to something unskillful, and they're able to remember that as the states come up. They don't put up blinders. They don't pretend that it's okay. They keep reminding themselves, okay, this is, you know the bad results of this particular kind of unskillful state. You've seen, seen it in other people. Well, it looks just like the same sort of thing in you, if other people see it in you. This way mindfulness helps keep you from making those changes that would destroy the things that you want, the true happiness that you want. It's interesting that in Thai, the words mindfulness and discernment, sati and banya, get put together and they mean intelligence. Intelligence is not only wisdom, but it's also the ability to keep things in mind, knowing what is important to keep in mind, the things that will protect you. This is why it's so important to remember that mindfulness does mean that, to keep something in mind. It's not simply just accepting what's arising and passing away. That's equanimity. Mindfulness is when you keep in mind the fact that there are skillful qualities and unskillful qualities. And if something unskillful comes up, you've got to get rid of it. If something skillful arises, you've got to encourage it. And if it hasn't arisen, you've got to give rise to it. That's what you want to remember. So it's remembering the right things and bringing them to bear all the time. That's what makes this kind of mindfulness intelligent. And so it protects you from the dangers of change. It teaches you how to make advantage, take advantage of the good side of change, the fact that skillful qualities can be developed. Then you use them to work on your unskillful qualities, so you're not overwhelmed by the fact that there's anxiety, fear, complacency, whatever the unskillful qualities are. They can seem so big when you don't have anything to shore you up, to provide you with a good foundation. We pick up the discernment from the, the Buddha and his noble disciples, and we try to remember it. And then as we see that it really does work in our lives, then it becomes more and more our own discernment. So we develop mindfulness and discernment to protect us from the dangers of change. And in developing them, we're taking advantage of the fact that the mind can change in a positive direction. 
always hold on to that fact. Because one of the worst things you can do is say, well, I'm just stuck here, I'm never going to get any better, and it's never going to change, so I just might as well give in to my old impulses. Skillful qualities can be developed. You can change. So we'll have to learn how, <clears throat> we have to learn how to be selective in how we approach the issue of change. And don't let it get in the way of true happiness. In fact, learn how to use it to take us to a true happiness. That's when you understand what the Buddha meant when he talked about change. <clears throat>